Good morning, church. How many of you love the Lord? How many of you love the Lord? Amen. It sounds like everybody loves the Lord that's in this building. Have God been good to you? Have God been good to you? He has been good to each and every one of us because he woke us up this morning to see another day. Because without him, your eyes would not have opened. He gave you two good gifts this morning. Open up your eyes to see and appreciate another day. It is good to be amongst you this morning to present God's word to you this morning. I am thankful. I am blessed in my life. I'm out of my comfort zone, but I'm still here preaching the word. Sometimes we have to get out of our comfort zone to present God's message. So I would like to welcome all of our visitors, your honored guests. You know, if we can um, attend to you in any kind of way, make sure that you let us know and we can attend to you. If any questions you have, we answer those questions. But we want to let you know that you are honored guests and that we will like for you to stay after worship service for a moment so we can get to know you a little bit better and see if we can serve some of your needs. I love the Lord. I do love the Lord. And he's been good to me. I'd like to thank the brothers for going out yesterday to evangelize the neighborhood. It was a blessing to be able to be a light in this community. And my brothers have shown the light by going to the neighbors and saying that we are here. We're amongst God's people that are here that truly love the Lord truly want to do the things that's fitting for the Lord. We'd like to thank all the efforts that's been placed for the, the clothing drive and the evangelistic part of, the, of the, our location. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we believe that you are the creator of the heaven and earth and everything in it. We are thankful to be able to be made in your image, in the image of your son, Jesus Christ, that we try to strive to be as. We look at the scriptures and mimic ourselves after him, trying to deliver your word to the lost of this world. We're thankful, Father, for that sacrifice that he made on behalf of mankind. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, that you seem fit, that you gave us the avenue to get back to you and to be part of your family. We're thankful. We love you. And we need you. This is our prayer in Jesus Christ. Amen. I would like to thank Alex for the message, for the scripture reading that he presented today uh, for me. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 16. And it is his version said, it's good news. It sounds like good news to me. He said, um, he did, go preach the good news. And then at the end, he said, anybody would be punished if you didn't accept the good news. And that was a different verse. I'm gonna read the New King James Version. I would like for you to open up your Bible. We're gonna do a little Bible study today. We're gonna um, see what the Lord said. It's not gonna be what Derek Carbon says. It's gonna be what the Lord said through his scripture, through his word. So we're gonna go through the scriptures. I would like to mention that the, in, in the near future, we're gonna be having a evangelistic, evangelistic class. And uh, we're going to teach how to go out or how to present God's word. It's a, it's a class that I used to teach called Christ Ambassadors course. We're going to be having that course taught here, and I will be the teacher. So this is a prelude to some of the information that I'm going to present in, in that class. So it's a evangelistic. So Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 16, the Bible says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he does not believe shall be condemned. The Alex person said, be punished. Punished by who? Punished by God, of course. Because these are God's words. He commands us to do certain things. We need to follow his instructions. We want to put a title to this lesson this morning, 
it would be tell someone he is risen. Tell someone he is risen. The question might be asked, what is the gospel? Well, we go to scripture and we find out and see what is the gospel. The apostle Paul tells us what the gospel is in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Turn the Bible, you're going to Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. And the apostle Paul says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jews first and also for the Greek. For in it, the power, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Power is in the gospel. Power, the dynamite is in there, his word. The gospel should be preached to every creature, every man, woman, boy and girl. What should you teach and what should you believe? Well, we believe the scriptures. You must believe that John 3.16, turn your Bibles there. John 3.16 and 17 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever shall believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, 2. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In that verse, chapter, in verse 16, describes God's feeling between men. That, and it's one word that you look in that passage, it's, you can see that that one word describes God's feeling is love. God loved mankind or loved the world. Verse 17, it says that, so the son might save the world or save mankind. Very important. Love, save the world, man, woman, boy, and girl. And he said to them, go preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized should be saved. But he who do not believe should be condemned. It's a command. There's no alternative. So in the book of Matthew, we have the fullest and the utmost systematic account of Jesus' life and his teaching. We see his birth and his childhood. We see his preparation for his ministry. We see his suffering and we see his death on the cross and we see his resurrection. Matthew, the author of the book of Matthew has a special object in, the, in his gospel to show the Jews that Jesus is the long expected Messiah, the son of David, and that his life fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy. It's a lot of verses that we have to prove that. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not one jolt or tittle will by no means pass from the law until everything is fulfilled. He said, not one jolt or tittle. You know, you write a contract. You write a contract and you have to cross all the T's and dot all the I's. If you didn't do that in your contract, it would read something totally different, right? It would read something totally different. So you have to cross those T's, dot those I's. So everything that's written in the law, all those little letters and all that stuff, that, I don't know, Hebrew writers, all that stuff had to be dotted before it was believed. It had to be complete. So Jesus fulfilled everything in, in the contract of God. Matthew, the book, is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And this statement links Christ to two great covenants that God made with David and Abraham. God's covenant with David 
consists of the promise of the king sitting on his throne forever. Samuel chapter 2, Samuel chapter 7, verse 8 through 13. God's covenant with Abraham promised that through him all families of the earth are blessed. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. David's son was a king. Abraham's son was a sacrifice. The Gospel of Matthew opens with the birth of Jesus, birth of the king, and it closes with his suffering and his death and his, his sacrifice. Matthew in the beginning and the end. Because sin, man cannot save himself, so he needed a savior. God paid the moral price that we owe him. When, Jesus, when we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So Christ died for mankind. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6, 18 says, For God also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus died a cruel death for mankind. But he rose again on the third day, according to the scripture. This is what we need to believe. We must tell the world that. God's people must tell the world that he is risen. As we look at Matthew, let's go to Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 45. We're going to see the death of Jesus on the cross. This is what we can show people. This is what we can share from from Matthew chapter 26 all the way to 28, we, can, we have that gospel outline of what we can tell folks. We study those three knowing that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that who shall ever believe in him to not perish but have everlasting life. We take those last chapters of Matthew, put it in our hearts, and we can teach a Bible class through that because it tells us everything in there. Now, verse 45 in chapter 27, now, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, last but not And this is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This point, God turned his back on Jesus because of the sin that he was carrying on of the world. Verse 50. And Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Jesus died, yielded up his spirit. 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earthquake and the rock split. In, in the Old Testament covenant, the priest had to go into the temple and he had to offer a sacrifice for himself before he go into the most holy of holiest place that behind the veil. And this scene right here, that veil was broken in two. And this scene right here. So Jesus sacrificed himself. He allowed, he can, or God allowed mankind to go through that veil now and don't have to go through priests. Everybody with me? That veil was torn. Now, now mankind have access to that the most holiest, holiest place. It says the, when the rock split open, the grave was open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, sleep was erased and carried, and coming out their graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Oh, can you imagine that? This is after the resurrection. They were resurrected. So this person, Bob Jones, was dead last week. But whenever, hey, Bob, I thought you was dead. What you doing alive? Well, Jesus, I don't know. Jesus, you know, all this stuff happened, this earthquake, tombs open, here I am. It's a miracle. Thank you, Lord, for, ooh, this is what happened. This is what the scripture is telling us. That's proof. Seeing is believing. Verse 50. And it says, and when the centurion, those with him, who was guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake 
and the things that happened, they feared greatly and said, truly, this was the son of God. See, it is believing. There's old Bob over there. <laughs> he was dead. But this was that. Sin is believing. And verse 55 is what we, and many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministered him. And there they were looking from far off from all the stuff that had happened. Amongst them was Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and, and Jose, and the mother of Zebedee's son. All these women were looking at what happened. This is a narrative type story, right? We can kind of see people, we see Jesus up on the hill going through all this stuff, the earthquake, we see all that stuff. I mean, it's a visual that we can understand and see. It says, as evening approached, there came a rich man. To this man, he came and he actually went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. So we're going to speed up a little bit for my time. So he he uh, asked for Jesus' body. He took Jesus' body and wrapped it in clean linen and placed it in his own tomb made out of a rock. It was made like a cave. It was basically like a cave. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sat opposite of the tomb. So they seen where Jesus was buried, the big tomb. The water baptism, big tomb. Big tomb was there. And they said opposite. Then it says in verse 62, the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. And they said, sir, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise. Again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples, his disciples, his disciples may come and steal his body and tell the people that he has been risen from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. He said, take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure and put the seal on the stone and posted the guard. The tomb, Jesus is in the tomb. We got water, he's in the tomb in a solid rock. Interesting. It was around his big interest. Huge rock. Okay, verse 62. Um, so, verse 1 in chapter 28. Now, after the Sabbath was the first day of the week began to dawn early in the morning. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Earthquakes. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone that was at the door and sat on it. That big stone that was in front of the entrance, rolled back. Rolled back. And he sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing was white as snow. And the guard shook with fear and became like dead men. That's interesting. That's a scary scene if you see that those guards guarding something, all of a sudden earthquake and then the big rock rolled away. You know, we get scared in California when we're, we earthquake, we all, right? We, you know, we scared, but he, not only the rock, rock rolled back, but an angel was there. That's added something else. So, I mean, you can understand they were scared. And then what it said, and it says that uh, the angel said to the women, to Mary and the other Mary, do not be afraid. I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. We know that you seek Jesus who was dead. He was on the cross, he died. He was dead, he wrapped it in, he put it in that tomb, right? He's not here. What it says, what your Bible says, he is what? Risen. Uh, excuse me, he is what? He is risen, he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Seeing is believing. But in the other words, they didn't see him, but still have to believe. The stone wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. Matthew chapter 20, verse 19 tells us that Jesus 
and his resurrection body could pass through material barriers. The stone was just rolled away so others could see into the tomb to see that Jesus has risen from the dead for our purpose, for the Mary's purpose. It's what we believe, the resurrection body of Jesus Christ. And go, he says to the, the, the women, go, verse 7, and tell the disciple that he is what? Excuse me? He is risen from what? From the dead. The gospel of Jesus. The good news, he is risen. Indeed, he is going before you into Galilee that you will see him. And behold, he said. So they went quickly from the tomb in fear greatly, in, in, uh, excuse me, with fear and great, great joy. So they were happy, but they were scared at the same time. And they ran and brought, brought word to the disciples. Verse 9. And they went to tell his disciples, Behold, Jesus, and Jesus met them saying, Rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worship him. So they was excited to see Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go tell my brethren to go to Galilee and they will see me. So it's instruction to go to Galilee and they will see Jesus. Now here's verse 11. While they was going, behold, the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened all the things that they seen. When they had assured the elders, they consulted together and they gave them a large uh, sum of money to the soldiers, saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while, he, while we slept. Okay. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease them and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they was instructed. And this saying is commonly reported amongst the Jews to this day. You know, the truth about that passage right there, if the guards were asleep, how could they have known that the disciples came and took his body away? And, other, and, and another thing about that passage too, knowing that a Roman soldier, if he's on guard and he was asleep, that's what? He lost that prisoner? executed, put to death. So that's, that's a lot. I mean, that's not the truth right there, right? We could see that. And knowing just a little bit of history about how treacherous the Roman soldiers were, protecting their, their prisoners, it's a lot. I remember Brother Mike last week had talked about, there was a passage in, in Acts chapter 36, or 536, about the Merrill, that's how you pronounce the name, uh, when, when the disciples was whipped and they was in prison and uh, they said, uh, went to the chief priest and said, you know, well, don't let the men go. You know, don't let, don't put, keep those men in prison and don't do nothing to them because, you know, if, if it's an upriser, well then it amount to nothing because that would be brought on by man. But if it was brought on by God, you can't stop it. Okay, everybody got that. I think I explained that right. <laughs> so, a lie is a lie. And if, if God is involved, he's all true. And God's word is true. So that's a lie right there. Okay, everybody with me? Amen. Everybody with me? Everybody with me? Amen. So, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away to Galilee into the mount, mountain which Jesus had appointed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubt. It's interesting. They worshiped him because he was there. And, you know, some doubt. Everybody has doubt sometimes. You know, everybody not always believe, but seeing is believing. So where's the doubt? You can see it. You can touch it. You can feel it. But that doubt is just because human nature but the proof was in the pudding, as, as they would say, he was standing right before. And here's, here's the other part of Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. This is, is, is the version that Matthew says, 
He says, and Jesus came to them. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. All power. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of age. Amen. He told his disciples to go. Because Jesus has authority, Christians are commanded to go. It is his authority that sends us out. It is his authority that guides us. And it is his authority that empowers us. Make disciples remind us that disciples are made. Disciples are not spontaneously created at conversion. They are a product of a process involving believers teaching and following God's word and being doers of God's word. But by that, it's not, it's not, you're done. It's a process. Okay? Jesus says that, I would have made one point. Yeah. Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the very end of age. Jesus sent his disciples with a mission to fulfill, but he did, not, he did not send them alone. He promised his constant presence would be more than enough strength to guide them, to guide the disciples or disciples. So obeying Jesus and making disciples of all nations, God will guide, or Jesus will guide. So we look at the resurrection. That resurrection means that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power and with the spirit of holiness and by the resurrection of the dead, Romans 1 and 4. The resurrection means that we have assurance of our own resurrection. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even God's soul will bring him to those who fall asleep in him. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14. The resurrection means that God has an eternal plan for those who believe and obey. Jesus said in John chapter 14, 2 and 3, in my father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and re receive you to myself. That where I am, you also will go. We love to sing mansion, robe, and crown. Mansion, robe, and a crown. If you follow God's word, obey him, guess what you're going to receive at the end of your life? A mansion, robe, and a crown. Crown. Everybody need to say hello on that part. Crown. Jesus also gave us great and precious promises that we can count on. God is so good to us. The resurrection means that Jesus has a continuing ministry. He is also able to save to the utmost those who come to God through him since he ever lives to make intercession for them. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. The resurrection proves that Though it looked like Jesus died on the cross as a common thief, criminal, he died for, sin, for sinful man out of love and self-sacrifice and for the guilt of mankind. Amen? The death of Jesus on the cross was a payment. The resurrection was the receipt showing that the payment was perfect in God's sight. God is good. Jesus said, I will be with you to protect you. I will be with you to direct you. I will be with you to comfort you. I will be with you to carry the work on of the grace in you. And in the end, I will crown you with immortality and joy and glory. Follow his word. 
When the disciples go out to share the gospel, remember this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing, knowing, having confidence, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Everything that you do for the Lord is not in vain. You get a no a thousand times for somebody, so yes out there that I will study the Bible with you, your work. A smile to somebody sometimes will pay off big dividends in their life. Spreading the word of God is always a good thing for Christians, good payment. Remember this also in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse four, 3 to 4. For this is a good and acceptable in God's sight the Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God desires everybody, everybody to be saved. Every man, woman, boy, and girl to be saved. This is our mission. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized should be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. Jesus saying that the good news of salvation is for everyone. Everyone who believes and is baptized and lives faithful unto death will be saved. No exception based on color, race, education, gender, or social position. Or position. Jesus makes it clear that those who Refuse not to believe, there's no other alternative to be saved. That punishment will be put on you. Jesus made it clear that there's no other way to be saved. I know people or different religions have different ways to convince people that their religion is right. So, but the scriptures tells us what to do in order to be saved. That's what we follow our Bible. We follow the scriptures of our Bible. Because a lot of the other religions, their tombs are still full of their leader. Full of their leader. Where our tomb of our Savior is empty. Big difference. And it says that he intercedes for the saints. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. In, in Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 to 6, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Tell someone he is risen. My lesson I pointed out in scripture that Jesus said, come to him on his terms, believe and be baptized. We have this tomb ready. We have the water ready. Jesus didn't have water, but he had power to raise up out of there. We have this water, no power in the water. It's just it's water, but it tells we must be buried in this water as if we was buried in the ground. It's like Jesus submerged, not sprinkled, poured. We need to be buried. Jesus already rolled the rock away. It's already there. The entrance is there. All we have to do is walk down the step, get in, and be baptized if you would like to be baptized. If you feel that your life is void and you need some direction, God is there for you. God would help you in your life. First, you have to get your sins washed away. And that's through water baptism. A song has been selected for those that are, might have on their mind to be baptized. This would be an opportunity for you to come up front and we can cater to your needs, we can baptize you. 
If you would like to have prayer, we have that also. We can pray for you. But whatever your need is, whatever your concern is, let it be known to us and we'll make sure that we are catered to your needs. As, the, as together we stand and sing that invitation song.